let them know. All right, so tonight, like I said, we're gonna do something a little special, a little different. We're gonna do something a lot like what I would do with the middle schoolers upstairs. Now, I did a series back in 2019 with them called The History of the World. And we broke down the entire world's history into thousand year chunks. It was a millennia every night. And we did six that each covered a millennia. And then later, after all that, we did just the last few years since 1997. So we're gonna do the same thing. I don't know when I'll get to part two and three and four and all those, but tonight we're just doing the first thousand years from creation on. And we're gonna cover that time period looking for what is God doing in that time period. So maybe you guys have wondered, you know, every now and then you get those strange Bible questions either from your own heart or from the, you know, the, the curious seven-year-old in your life. Could Noah have met Abraham? You know, something like that, where you're just not sure about the timeline. There's no verse that says, you know, Noah did, didn't, could, couldn't. You just have to do a whole bunch of math, stack it up to find out stuff like that. Little things like I, I heard when studying Ruth, that Ruth happens during the time of the judges. My immediate question, what period of time in the book of Judges did it occur? Because there's parts of Judges where it's like a time of peace and everything's great. There's other parts of Judges where, it's, you know, it's Samson time and is the opposite of peace. It is going very poorly and very loud. So little questions like that that are really hard to figure out by just reading the verses on the page. You actually have to start reading every book and sort of slotting them over each other and figuring out dates and times and ages. And so I've done the math for you guys. I've stacked it all up. And uh, now we can answer interesting questions like what happened between the time that John the Apostle died and the Catholic Church came to, to rise? What was going on in that period? And in it all, we get to see the plan of God working. We get to see what is he doing in human history? What is he doing in the lives of his people? So if any of that stuff interests you, then this is the study for you guys. And like I said, I don't know when part number two is coming, uh, but we'll see. So I, I think it's important to do these kinds of studies. If for no other reason than a really firm understanding of history, I think encourages us to trust our Bibles. The more we study our Bible and match it up against history, the more we see the accuracy of the Bible and the trustworthiness in it. So in these seven part stories, as we see God's plan, uh, we're gonna see that it's a redemption plan, that God is constantly working to redeem humanity. Tonight, though, we're going to just look at those first thousand years, like I mentioned. And we're going to see all the way from the creation of the world and mankind with it to the problem of sin introduced and death with that. And then before we're done, we're going to get to see at the end of those thousand years a promise of life after this one. All the way back in Genesis, a promise to, for eternal life. And that's just in the first five chapters. That's it. So that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time today. We'll do a few cross-references, but mostly just in the first five chapters of Genesis. So pop open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Read with me those first five verses. Genesis chapter 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. There is a presupposition in these first words of our Bibles that God exists. It doesn't explain his existence. It doesn't try and defend his existence. It just assumes his existence. And if you look at the Hebrew, it mixes plurals and singulars in that first statement in such a way that it leads us to believe he is triune from the very first verse of the Bible. It gives us a picture that he is more than one in one. This, this state that he exists in that we can't even comprehend, that he is three in one, three persons, one God. Then we learn that he peers at disorder. He's floating over the earth, this formlessness, and he creates not just order out of chaos, but beauty and goodness. The first thing needed for all of this to work is light. You need light to show something. You need light to make things seen. And he did this by speaking. It's the first instance recorded in our Bibles of God speaking. And what does he do with that speech? He brings light into the world. And so he reveals something to us just in that statement that his word brings light. 
by that light, you get life. By that light, you get beauty. That is the power of his word. And we'll see that throughout scripture. There is much more that he makes in this creation week. I think most of you are familiar to a certain degree with the seven days of creation. You know, on day seven, he rests. But suffice it to say that he reveals all of this to show his role as the creator, the one who is the start to all this. And since then, all of man's attempts to explain our existence, the universe's existence, apart from God, they've been empty and half-baked. They don't get down to the real question of where does something come from if before it there was nothing. Evolution has become a sort of religious dogma of a naturalistic, materialistic worldview. But any of the predictions that Darwin's ideas contained were disproven during his lifetime. The archaeologists, the paleontologists of Darwin's day laughed at his theories because the fossil record already was known to contradict his suppositions. They knew that the day he published his book, the first time they ever read it. And the hubris that our supposed descent from apes has enjoyed is basically all it will ever amount to. I spend a lot of time looking into this stuff because our middle schoolers spend a lot of time asking about this kind of stuff. And the more and more I look into it, the more and more certain I become that it is just something to cling to when you don't have something else. I was once, though, a young teenager, and I sought to harmonize God's role in creation with evolution. I I tried to find some sort of compromise. I really wanted to bring together everyone and everything that I loved. I loved science. I I loved learning. I loved that ascertaining of knowledge, and I loved people, people who believed in God, people who believed in evolution, and I wanted everything to just get along. But the evidence runs so counter to evolutionists' claims that there really isn't any good reasons left to believe as they do unless you first find yourself opposed to God, opposed to the existence of a creator, opposed to creation at its simplest. Then you need to believe something. You need to believe that this all came from somewhere, somehow. Well, then you can believe just about anything. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul says that creation calls out to us, and it demands the hand of a creator by its very existence. You can't explain a universe by chance. I don't know if you've ever thought about this from a philosophical point of view. Chance is not a creative force. In fact, chance is not a force. You you can't use chance to explain a coin toss. Have you ever thought about this? A coin toss can be recorded, a coin toss can be tracked, and over the course of many coin tosses, you can establish the odds of a certain outcome. But chance never gets a coin to flip through the air. Chance never gets it to come back down. Chance never looks at it to see what it was. Chance does not have these abilities to cause things to occur. Chance just records the probability of a certain outcome. You have to already have the outcome. You have to have all the forces that made it happen. Chance can't do that. So you are here because God made all this, and he made us. And he knows us. He knows you specifically. That's a beautiful thing. Just to say generically, yes, there's some creator God out there. That's not actually a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's not helpful at all. That doesn't immediately bring light and life into your life. No, you actually have to get to know that God. He would actually have to be a good and a loving God. And that is the truth that we find in his word. Psalm 139, 13 through 14 says, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. But God didn't stop creating just at the material things. He did all of that. But he had some other ideas that were worth relaying right from the start. And so we get to Genesis chapter 2. You can skip ahead. Genesis chapter 2, down at verse 21. It says, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. Adam's the first man he made. And he slept, 
And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This sets up one of the most important institutions in all of human existence. God has this plan from the very start for us to have a bond, a bond so close, a bond of companionship, a bond of intimacy, right from the start. You see, God already enjoyed all of those qualities inside the Trinity, and he wants us to have that sort of close relationship. He wants us to have that with our mate, our spouse, but he wants us to have that relationship with him, close and intimate. Adam and Eve did have that sort of relationship with God. We see them walking in the garden, talking with him. But once sin enters the picture, once sin enters a relationship of any kind, it causes damage. Damage needs healing. And the greater the damage, the costlier the healing. Jump on down to Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 4. Genesis 3, 4 through 7. It says, Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Satan, it seems, always has a little bit of truth mixed in with his lies. Makes him go down easier. And he was right about something. Just this one point. uh, Up to this period of time, Adam and Eve hadn't experienced evil. And so by disobeying God's command to not eat of this one tree, that would actually introduce them to something that God already understood. And they didn't understand. There was something that God had, an understanding of what evil was and what evil can do, that they didn't have. And so Satan wasn't lying about that part. He he got that right. You do this, and you're going to know something God knows that you don't. That sounds good, right? You see... Once you've been through it, once you come out the other side, it's so easy to look back and judge. It's so easy to look back and go, well, clearly this was a bad idea. And if anyone ever presents it to you like that, you know, hey, you know, there's some wickedness and evil you don't know about yet. You want me to show you? You can just say, yep, it's pretty wise to say no. <laughs> Automatically, I don't even need to know what the evil thing is. That, that just makes sense. That's not how Eve saw it, though. We actually read in 1 Timothy, Paul writes this to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. The idea there is that she actually heard what Satan said and she thought, that means this is good for me. To be more like God. To have this sort of shortcut. That's how she was thinking about it. I can become more like God by just doing this. So she was deceived. But Paul doesn't let Adam off the hook. He says, Adam was not deceived. Adam knew that he would be disobeying God to do this. Even if he thought, you know, maybe these are things in a balance. Maybe this is a good thing over here, but also God said no. Maybe he wasn't clear on it, but he did absolutely understand. If I do this, I'm disobeying God. And we each have done the same. We have each knowingly acted against what is right. What we know to be right. We've each knowingly betrayed the conscience that God's given us, and the commands that God's given us. And now we carry with us that guilt. And unless something can remove it from us, it just stays with us. Unless something can remove it from us, we carry that guilt to our grave. So why does that matter? Why does it matter that you have guilt in your life? Why is that such a big deal? Why is this the opening to the entire Bible, the opening to human history? Paul answers that one too. He does it in Romans 5. And this answers another question I get sometimes. An infinite God, right? He can do anything. Why can't he just forgive us free and clear? Why can't he just point at the whole world and point his forgiveness gun and go zap and everyone's forgiven all at once? 
check out Romans 5. Romans 5, 12 through 15 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by one man's offense many died, much more. The grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Death is attached to us the same way our sin nature is attached to us. It's by inheritance. It's by birth. We are powerless to rid ourselves of it. And left uncured, it is 100% fatal. That is the state we find ourselves in. That is the state we find ourselves in. We were born into death. Luckily, that's not the end of our study tonight. That would be quite the downer to finish on. No, 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 no. There's much more that takes place in these thousand years. This is all still right at the beginning. And, and the, the great hope of eternal life, of a life after this one, comes through in chapter 5. Before we get there, though, we have to cross through chapter 4. Chapter 4 contains the first big consequence of the fall. Let's read about Adam and Eve's first two sons, Cain and Abel. So this will be Genesis 4, 3 through 8. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. We'll just stop there because I think it gets the point across. God's rejection of Cain's sacrifice might seem mysterious, and it isn't well explained here in Genesis. And many people who start reading their Bible right at the beginning get to this part and they go, huh, I wonder why. I wonder why God rejected the sacrifice. Now, you might guess if you've read your Bible that, you know, it has something to do with a blood sacrifice. If this was a sacrifice to cover sin, God made clear every chance he got, and he does it a lot in the Old Testament, that something to cover sin needs to be a blood sacrifice. And maybe that was the case, maybe it wasn't. Uh, it looks like we have Abel's sacrifice being of an animal, so that would count. But really, we get more explanation when we get down to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 explains this and something we're going to read in chapter 5. So we're going to hold off. We'll get to that in a minute. For now, just hold on to that thought. God sets the standards for what is a, an acceptable sacrifice. He's the one who sets the standards. So if you don't make the cut, that means you didn't meet the standards. It's like being upset with the Olympic Committee that you didn't qualify when you didn't practice and you're overweight and you don't know how to ski, and they won't let you go ski in the Olympic competition. That's just not fair. Well, isn't it though? Yeah, they're the one who sets the standard. If you meet the standard, you get to ski. Simple. So God's the one receiving the sacrifice. He gets to set the standard. And if you could go back in time, this event had so many repercussions within this little family. Because you have to think about this, that this group of humans is just one family. It's just all the people who've descended from Adam and Eve. I don't know how far they've spread yet, but they're all related. So it's not as though some random person murdered your uncle. No, this is, this is like the two oldest guys in the family besides Adam and Eve, and one killed the other. That would be absolutely devastating. There's also a lot of hinting here and later in Scripture that, that God's promise of a Messiah was maybe just vaguely, but at least understood by them. That they understood that that thing he said during the curse of, you know, there's going to be someone to crush the head of the snake, that they got that, that it carried weight and meaning for them. It wasn't just some cryptic message from God. So I would think that the oldest guy in the family might be like the prime candidate in their head, at least. 
This is the one who's going to make God's promises come true. Now, I am guessing at that. I don't really know. But there is some thought to God's going to do something to redeem us. And now before anything like that comes true, we have brother killing brother. That would have absolutely devastated them. They would have messed up any thoughts they had for who was going to be this Messiah, or at least what line the Messiah was going to come through. But you see, God's plan wasn't being derailed. He did not see this as a surprise or an upset. He knew each of these failures long before they ever occurred. And his plan of redemption was going to continue through a new son, though, Seth. Adam and Eve have another son named Seth, and Seth's line leads all the way down to Jesus. Before that line progresses too far, though, we get Enoch. Enoch is born, and he is, he is just a man of amazing faith. He has such faith in God. It's beyond all of his peers. Something special happens with him. This is in chapter 5 of Genesis starting at verse 21. It says, Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And so we have this picture of human life existing. We're, we're populating the earth. There's people everywhere. We're just starting to grow this one family outward. And then, out of the blue, one guy who has amazing faith in God just disappears. He just goes up to be with God. And immediately, this confirms something that, remember, this is before the whole Bible was written, before any of the Bible was written. This confirms the idea that there is somewhere else you could go besides here. Does that make sense? Like, up to this point, you, you all know Adam and Eve. Everyone in the family has met Adam and Eve. They're all talking to Adam and Eve. So you can just ask them, yeah, what was it like? Oh, yeah, we were walking in the garden. It was great, and this and that, and the other thing happened, and God told us this, and God told us that. But there's been no Bible. There's been no temple. There's been no priest. There's been no talk of what might come after this. Because the plan of redemption hasn't played out. Not many details have been revealed. And then all of a sudden, someone in the family is taken by God to be where God is. That would kind of blow some minds. That would introduce the concept, like there's somewhere else you could be besides here. Huh. And so you have this picture, a man of faith, and he gets to go be with God. This gets fleshed out more as you keep reading your Bible. And so in these first thousand years, you, you've already made like a huge leap. You've started at creation You've seen sin and death enter the world, and death in a very horrific way. And then you also see the glimmer of something great, of something redemptive that can take you out of this existence and bring you up to something heavenly. And there's still another 3,000 years plus before Jesus is going to be born to Mary. That whole part of the story has not even come close to happening yet, but already God's promise means something. It's not as though he made this promise to Adam and Eve. Oh yeah, someday, someday someone will crush the head of the snake. Yeah, someday. And then for 3,000 years, he does nothing. No, 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 no. Right away in this first family, he's already at work. Hebrews 11 explains these chapters quite well. It says in verses four through six, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And through it, he being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's it. That's the only way to please him. You can do, you know, 10,000 good things in your life and you're still going to have the stain. You're still going to have the guilt of your sin. Every good thing you could possibly do does not get rid of the wrong things you've done. And so if you want to please God, you need to actually have all those sins forgiven, all of that wiped away. And the example we see in Abel and Enoch's life is that faith is what's required. God's redemptive plan can place his righteousness on you. Your account filled up 
by his resources. And it can cover your sins right over with the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And all it takes to begin this redemption in your life is to embrace Jesus in faith, to trust him as your Lord and as your Savior. And this is what God was doing in those first thousand years. It's just one family growing up, and eventually there's someone in the family that gets to show them all. What is God's plan for them? It's not to stay here forever and just live out an earth life. It's that he has something greater. And down the road, at the end of this plan, we're going to see as we keep going and keep going and keep going, we get all the way through these different millennia, the plan is real, true unity, where heaven and earth come back together. Something like the garden, but even better. That's going to be the plan at the end. Interesting little quote I read today. Sin and death entered the world when Eve looked at Adam and said, take and eat. But later, when Jesus is here, he says to his disciples, as he passes around the cup of wine, as he passes around the bread, he tells them, take and eat. And later in Revelation, we read that there's going to be a tree of life in heaven, and God's going to hand out to everyone who's there and say, take and eat. I think that's kind of beautiful to see it happen at the fall, to see it happen at the act of redemption, and then to see it at the completion of redemption. A full circle all the way through history. Let's pray.